right. Thank you so much, Dirk, for that wonderful introduction. Um, fortunately, F, uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy, you can just call it F mirrors because we've said that multiple times this talk would be twice as long. Um, so thank you everybody for the invite. I'm really excited to be um, kicking off the lecture series this year. All right, where's my mouse? There we go. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get us started off with thinking about something that I think we all think about a lot, which is the nature of stroke and aphasia recovery. Um, so as we all know, aphasia affects approximately one third of acute stroke survivors and aphasia persists um, into the chronic phase. So that's considered sometimes six months post-stroke, sometimes 12 months post-stroke and about 15 to 40% of those individuals. So um, in this uh, short recovery window that we have within the first six or 12 months, the goal is to try and maximize the amount of recovery that patients can experience before the onset of that chronic stage. Because as we all know, by the time somebody enters that chronic stage, aphasia is a chronic condition and folks who ha still have persistent aphasia might go on to be aphasic for the remainder of their lives. Um, and so that means that we need to have targeted treatments that maximize neuroplasticity before the onset of that um, chronic stage. However, as we all know, there's a lot of variability in language recovery and response to therapy, and that's a hallmark of post-stroke aphasia. And so that looks something like this, where you might have one person um, there uh, that's kind of um, uh, uh, denoted by the graph to the far left, where they have very severe impairments at the uh, acute stage, but they demonstrate, demonstrate this really nice and quick recovery. Somebody who has um, a slower um, rise uh, in language skills um, that kind of plateaus over time and then somebody who doesn't recover very much. And at this point, there are a lot of factors that we know that are important for predicting outcomes. So for example, um, Poor outcomes have been linked to larger stroke size, perhaps posterior rather than frontal lesions, um, more severe um, deficits in linguistic skills and non-linguistic cognition skills at the onset of, of stroke. And then demographic variables actually haven't been proven to be very predictive um, across the board, but um, something that's also been investigated. So these are just a handful of the factors that we know um, influence um, aphasia uh, outcomes. And yet at this point, we still can't predict whether somebody who's just had a stroke, what their language skills are going to look like at six months, at 12 months. So at this point, we know that, of course, stroke affects brain structure, but stroke also affects brain function. And so it's important to understand what patterns um, of functional activation and connectivity are linked to poor versus good outcomes in this really critical um, early recovery window. But at this point, there really actually just aren't that many functional imaging studies in acute and subacute aphasia. And this point um, was brought um, to light really nicely in a paper from a couple of years ago um, by Stefanik et al, where they concluded that there are too few studies in subacute patients in the literature to contrast them um, to chronic post-stroke aphasia in their meta-analyses. So that kind of begs the question, if there aren't that many functional imaging studies of acute and subacute aphasia, what's the reason for that? So there are a multitude of reasons, most likely, but one um, potential contribution to the lack of studies could be some of the logistics limitations and challenges of the most commonly used functional imaging modality, which is fMRI. So fMRI, obviously, is not portable. Um, well, most fMRI machines aren't portable. Um, uh, there are contraindications. Some patients can't undergo fMRI imaging. It's very expensive. And so, of course, researchers need a fair amount of grant funding in order to do fMRI research. And then even if you're able to obtain fMRI scans um, in uh, individuals with um, post stroke aphasia, fMRI time series are very susceptible to motion artifacts. So this is kind of setting the stage for, you know, a potential alternative um, tool that we can use to um, study aphasia recovery, which is um, functional near infrared spectroscopy or FNIRS for short. 
So FNIRS is less costly than fMRI. Um, it's portable, and that means it can be performed um, at different testing sites. So for example, at bedside and rehab units, um, et cetera. So the picture that you see here is actually um, the FNIRS setup in my lab at Northeastern. Um, and so those two little white boxes, they're FNIRS chassis um, that are connected to the cap with the sensors that are called optodes that are also linked to our acquisition laptop. And then we present stimuli on that monitor that's in front of the chair there. So it's a pretty self-contained system um, and pretty easy to transport from point A to point B. Um, so FNIRS has a lot of advantages over fMRI. Um, there are also some disadvantages, so I'm happy to talk about those more in the Q&A. But despite the advantages, um, FNIRS has been underutilized in aphasia research. Um, to my knowledge, these are all of the aphasia, um, post-stroke aphasia studies using FNIRS to date. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that FNIRS is actually really a, a much newer tool than fMRI. And that might mean um, that some of you and some people ultimately watching this might not be as familiar with FNIRS. So what I'm going to do before I actually talk about a couple of studies, um, I'm going to give a really quick FNIRS primer. So, um, sorry, is there a way, can I minimize this um, just so... I definitely don't want to do all those things. Can drag it to the bottom. The audience online is not seeing. I think if you put that towards this, it has the option to hide your phone. Okay. Hide. No. Oh, thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I just didn't, something is going to get covered up. Um, okay. So when you design um, an imaging experiment, this isn't just specific to FNIRS. This is specific to any sort of task-based imaging. As you design an experiment such as this is you show um, a participant a series of pictures. You ask them to name those pictures out loud. The idea behind that is that that is going to induce um, a, ch a change in neural activity, um, which then due to neurovascular coupling um, induces a change in brain metabolism. Ultimately, um, that results in um, an increase in oxy oxygenated hemoglobin, so oxyhemoglobin, abbreviated HBO, and a small dip in deoxyhemoglobin, which is abbreviated HBR. So in FNIRS, um, what we're actually measuring is we're measuring an indirect, it's an indirect measure of brain activity um, with increases in oxyhemoglobin and de um, decreases in deoxyhemoglobin. Um, but how does this actually work? So um, you have a participant who wears a cap. The cap includes sensors that are called optodes. There are two types of optodes. Um, sources, um, which are denoted by the little red flags in that picture, um, emit near-infrared light in continuous wave systems, typically two wavelengths of light within the near-infrared spectrum. That light shines through the hair and the scalp and the skull down to um, the cortex, typically a depth of about two centimeters. Um, and then the light travels in a very characteristic pathway um, and reemerges in kind of this banana-shaped um, path back up to the head surface and is detected by um, detectors. And the detectors are denoted by those little blue flags in the picture. And so there are a couple of important things just to keep in mind as I continue on with this talk. Um, one is the way that this works again is that um, uh, uh, hemoglobin in the brain absorbs near infrared light. And so the change in opt opt optical density as light um, emerges back to the head surface can be transformed into changes in um, uh, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin to give you this characteristic response to um, stimuli within your experiment. Another important thing to keep in mind is that unlike EEG, the measurement from FNIRS actually comes from the midline point between each source detector pair. And so each source detector pair is called a measurement channel. So I'm going to talk about channels throughout the rest of this talk, and so that's what I'm talking about. Um, long distance channels are typically three centimeters apart. Again, that samples are on two centimeters down to the cortex. There are also short distance channels, which as it sounds like the source de detector pair are closer together. That gives you a shallower measurement of physiological noise that then you can regress out in your analyses. Okay, so this is kind of like the two second or maybe two minute um, uh, FNIRS primer. So there are some special considerations of FNIRS imaging and the way that it works that can affect data quality. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about two studies um, that I did as part of my work in R.G. Hillis's lab as a postdoc. Um, because there are so few um, ethnier studies in post-stroke aphasia, the first study I'm actually going to talk about is um, about ethnier state of quality and the effect of task type and participant factors on ethnier state of quality. Um, the second paper I'll um, review is one that just came out earlier this year, where we investigated resting state connectivity in acute and subacute post-trochophagia um, with a, sub, uh, a subsample of the larger cohort that I'll talk about in study one. Then I'll wrap up with a couple of brief conclusions in future directions, and then I'll take any questions and comments that you have. Okay, so first study. So FNR's data quality can be affected by um, many different factors. So instrument noise is a source of um, that, that can affect data quality. Of course, motion artifacts. Um, this can be due to general movement, um, eyebrow raising in certain experiments with channels over the, um, the frontal um, pole. Um, and in our experiments, perhaps speaking would induce motion. So this is not... Um, this isn't specific to FNIRs. Motion artifacts are a problem with any sort of functional neuroimaging. Um, the good thing is that FNIRs is more robust to motion artifacts than other some other neuroimaging modalities, but it's still um, it's still a factor that needs to be considered. Um, environmental factors can also in, uh, impact data quality. So, for example, ambient light. What I'm going to focus on today are actually are participant characteristics. And so, from previous studies in neurologically healthy individuals, um, we know that individuals that have thicker skulls have higher levels of melanin, um, so darker skin tones. Folks with darker, thicker hair um, have decreased data quality because light is attenuated as it passes through surfaces, different substances. Um, so this is, again, known in neurologically healthy individuals, but it's worth replicating and testing in individuals who have um, a history of stroke as well, given um, how uh, the novelty of this, this method in our um, population. What is, I think, relatively unknown is the effect of different stroke factors on FNIR's data quality. Um, now, I say this, there, has, there have been more studies that have been done um, using FNIRs to study motor recovery. Um, and so this is um, specific uh, to um, post-stroke aphasia recovery, but I just also want to mention that. So factors that could impact data quality include stroke chronicity, so perhaps individuals in the acute phase um, who have more... Um, um, concomitant medical issues perhaps might have more motion than somebody who's had longer to recover. Um, overall severity might have an impact as well as the impact of lesion as well. So in this um, study, I'm going to talk about three research questions. So the first um, question we asked whether FNIR's data quality differs from stroke survivors and neurologically healthy controls. And this is important because in um, future FNIR studies um, and in most studies, we often use a control sample um, comparison. And so um, we want to make sure that um, the differences that we see between groups are due to something that's meaningful related to our research questions and not just differences in data quality between FNIRs, um, uh, between the two samples. Our second research question, we wanted to know if data quality differed between different types of FNIRs tasks within each participant group. Now, um, again, this is to be expected that there should be some differences depending on um, the uh, amount of motion that would be um, associated with a given task. And then finally, our third research question, we wanted to know if FNIRs data quality um, varies as a function of participant factors. And I'll break that down a little bit more on the next few slides. Okay, so this slide shows our participants. Um, this is uh, somewhat of a convenient sample in that um, we at Johns Hopkins um, added FNIRs as part of um, the protocol to a few existing, of a couple of existing studies, ongoing studies at the time. These are participants that were seen between October 2020 and uh, August of 2023. Um, and so this includes 89 um, patients with a history of either left hemisphere or right hemisphere stroke. Um, I want to bring your attention to the fact that um, the first time somebody completed FNIRs, there were 50 um, patients who were at the acute phase, 17 at the subacute phase, and 22 that were at the chronic phase. And then there were a subset um, of these patients who completed FNIRs at additional time points. 
So a couple of things that probably also jumped out to you is the fact that there are demographic differences between um, our, our patients and our controls. So um, that was done semi-purposely in that we um, purposely recruited some younger healthy adults to complete FNIRS imaging in addition to um, a sample of 15 older adults. And then the demographic, uh, the race differences and the education differences weren't expected, but as part of this initial study, um, uh, we looked at the effects of age and race specifically on FNIRS data quality. Um, so the FNIRS tasks that we added, they're included in our pro protocol, um, include five different tasks. Today, I'm gonna talk about three of them. Um, if you wanna know more about the other two, happy to talk about them. Um, in addition to the three I'm gonna talk about, we also have a prosody task and a finger tapping task. Um, but of the ones I'm covering today, the first is a discourse comprehension task. So in this task, um, participants hear stories from the discourse comprehension test. Um, the control condition is a reverse speech um, condition, and it's a passive um, it's a passive task. It's about six minutes long, and our protocol includes two runs of, of this task. Um, the second task is an overt picture naming task. Um, here, the control condition is a scrambled picture um, where they say skip when they see one of these pictures. Um, there are 10 items per block. They have three seconds to name each item. Um, you'll notice those black rectangles. When they see a black rectangle, they do nothing. That's to try and mitigate any sort of anticipatory effects, especially in the skip condition. Um, and so this um, task is uh, about seven minutes per run. Um, and there are two runs. The first, um, one of them is object naming, and then the other one is action naming. And then finally, the, task, the last task I'm gonna talk about today is a resting state um, task. This is um, where they're just seated comfortably, eyes open with their eyes fixated on the cross. Um, each run is about seven minutes and our protocol includes um, two runs of, of resting state. So the FNIRS data quality measures that I'm going to um, talk about in this study were extracted from the QT NIRS toolbox um, from Luca Paolanini's group. This is available on GitHub. So if you just Google QT NIRS GitHub, that's the first thing that pops up. Um, and it's pretty easy to use. Um, and if anybody is doing FNIRS um, imaging or is interested in getting started, I'd be happy um, to talk about um, you know, more about this if you run into any problems. But the good thing is it is pretty user friendly. So I'm gonna talk um, about three measures we extracted from this toolbox. So the first is a measure of um, uh, the extent of scalp to optode coupling. So in FNIRS imaging, you need to have good um, contact between the optode and the scalp and that the optode needs to be perpendicular to the scalp. So the scalp coupling index is a measure of cardiac pulsation. So if you have good contact with the scalp, you should have a strong um, cardiac signal. Um, and just to remind you there, in most systems, there are two wavelengths of light. And so the scalp coupling index is a cross correlation of the filtered signal uh, at both of those wavelengths. So the ideal here is that if you have really good scalp to opto coupling, there should be perfect synchrony between those two measurements. So that would be a coefficient of one. Um, uh, Polanini's group um, suggested that anything above 0.8 is considered good. So scalp, the scalp coupling index um, is again, a measure of scalp to opto coupling, but it can also be artificially inflated by motion. So in addition to that, we also looked at peak spectral power. Um, so this is a measure that reflects the power per unit area per unit wavelength of light. And so if there's a lot of motion, this measure is decreased. Um, in uh, in Polanyi's papers, um, they recommend anything above a 0.1 threshold, um, 0 0.1 threshold is considered good. And then finally, we looked at the total number of bad channels. So total number of bad channels reflects a combination of the other two measures. Specifically, channels are flagged bad um, if greater than 70% of time windows within the time series fall below the scalp coupling index and peak spectral power thresholds. Um, and a couple other notes. So I want to mention that these are the thresholds that are the default within the toolbox. I'm gonna to kind of give a little bit more context when I wrap up this study. Um, also just to kind of keep all of these different measures straight, um, scalp coupling and C's are always in blue font. 
power is always in orange and bad channels are always in purple. Okay, so first we investigate if they're just differences between all patients and all controls. Now I should mention that um, for a few reasons, we use non-parametric statistics, very unequal, unequal sample sizes, and also we had a lot of in-home um, uh, issues with the distribution of the residuals and um, homogeneity of the residuals. So these are non-parametric stats. Um, and the, these uh, data are the time one data, so mean the very first time that anybody um, underwent FNIR's imaging. So here we found, whoops, here we go. So here we found that there were no statistically significant differences between controls and patients at time one in any three of these measures. Now, that being said, you'll notice that there's a fair amount of variability, especially um, in the number of bad channels. And um, it looks like there might be some differences um, by task. So I'm gonna break this down a little bit more and um, talk about first is whether there are task differences within each group. So here we found that within controls and within patients, there were no um, statistically significant differences in scalp coupling indices by task. That's in contrast to um, peak spectral power. So here we found that there was significantly reduced um, power for naming compared to discourse and rest, whereas discourse and rest were fairly equivalent with each other. And then a similar trend in the patient group. So here naming was significantly lower than rest. Statistically, discourse and naming were equivalent-ish, but it, you can see that the plots, um, the plot for patients looks quite a bit like the plot for um, controls. And then finally, the number of bad channels followed the power results. So here we found that there was an increased number of bad channels for naming compared to discourse and rest. Again, discourse and rest were fairly equivalent within the control group. And then the same thing was found um, for our patient group. Okay, so next um, I'm gonna talk about the effects of participant factors. So first we looked at session number. So just to explain this a little bit, um, again, we had a subset of our patients who underwent FNIRS imaging at multiple time points um, as part of their participation in um, uh, one to two of three to four studies. Um, and so some individuals um, did at least, everybody did at least two sessions, some individuals did up to four. So the idea here is that we want to know if we're trying to investigate how um, brain activity changes as a function of language therapy, for example, if you do pre and post um, treatment uh, imaging with FNIRS, you wanna know that the difference that you see is not just because of data quality. And so here we see, um, this is a, a spaghetti plot for each task for scalp coupling indices. Um, each line uh, aligns with a participant. And um, what you might notice is that across um, uh, all three tasks, scalp coupling indices were mostly stable for the majority of patients. How are the folks that had the most um, instability, if you will, are those that tended to have lower um, scalp coupling indis, um, index values. Now, for scalp coupling indices, we didn't see any significant results at a group level, and that was also the case for peak spectral power and for the number of bad channels. But you'll notice here that there's some movement within certain patients. So, for example, also for peak spectral power, um, that when um, uh, people did have change over time, peak spectral power did tend to increase. Again, not st statistically significant at a group level. And then this is a bit messier and a little harder to follow, but when folks had um, a change in the number of bad channels over time, that tended to decrease. So this, again, not significant at a group level, but really important for when you're considering um, single subject um, data and single subject experimental designs. Um, so next, we wanted to know if certain stroke factors would have um, an influence on data quality. So one measure that we investigated is months since um, uh, stroke, stroke onset. And so the idea here is, again, that maybe folks in the acute phase um, would have more or worse data quality than folks that have had longer to recover. 
Um, because two of the three tasks are language tasks, we might expect that individuals with the history of left hemisphere would struggle more with the tasks, which might impact data quality to a greater extent than somebody with a history of right hemisphere stroke. And then within the left hemisphere stroke group, we investigate whether there is a relationship between data quality measures and overall aphasia severity, um, according to the Western aphasia battery um, aphasia quotient. And so what we found is that there were no statistically significant difference uh, uh, associations between any three of the data quality measures and months of stroke, nor a relationship between stroke laterality, nor um, a relationship between overall aphasia severity and data quality, um, which I would say are all good signs. And these are all um, before correction for multiple comparisons. So next we looked at relationships between participant demographics. So this is um, the time point one data for both patients and controls. So what we found is that there is a significant relationship between older age and um, uh, better scalp coupling indices. Um, you can see there's a fair amount of scatter, but this is in stark contrast to the fact that there doesn't seem to be a relationship between peak spectral power and older age, nor one with bad channels. Next, we looked at differences in data quality between men and women. Um, we found that scalp coupling indices were significantly lower for women compared to men for all three tasks. Peak spectral power um, tended to be lower for women than men for rest, which is also the case um, for the other two tasks, although not quite as much of a difference. And then we saw a significant difference between men and women in the number of bad channels for rest. Again, not a significant difference for the other two tasks, but still women tended to have um, more bad channels than men did. And then finally, we looked at the effect of race. So um, if you can remember back to the participant table that I showed you, um, we had um, uh, Asian participants, black participants, and white participants. Our sample of um, uh, Asian participants was quite small. So these comparisons here are between black and white participants. And we found here that scalp coupling indices did not significantly differ between white and black participants for all three tasks. Um, peak spectral power tended to be lower um, for black and white participants for rest. Um, that was also the case for the other two tasks, again, but what didn't reach statistical significance. And the same thing for a number of bad channels. So there was a significant um, uh, number of bad channels was significantly higher in black participants compared to white participants for rest. Again, kind of trends in that similar direction for the other two tasks as well. Okay, so these are some interim conclusions from this first study. So one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is, um, despite some of the um, difference between um, uh, groups of individuals in this study, um, one general um, good finding, positive finding, is that the average scalp coupling um, index and peak spectral power measures tended to be above the thresholds um, uh, that I mentioned uh, on that slide earlier. However, we do have a higher number of bad channels, um, partially because the defaults in the QT nearest toolbox are set rather conservatively. In addition to that, our our analysis included not just those long distance channels, but also the short distance channels. And from the short distance channels, you expect for there to be, they're just noisier channels. Um, so here we found that there was significantly um, lower power and increased number of bad channels for naming compared to the other two tasks. Again, this is to be expected. Naming is the work for speaking task, um, whereas the other two tasks are passive and there's rather little motion involved with them. Um, one thing that's important that I didn't mention we haven't looked at yet is which specific, specific channels are driving these results. Um, Having done this task with quite a few folks, I know that it's the temporal cha channels that are the most problematic, which makes sense given um, that we're talking about jaw movement. So again, this is sort of expected finding a bit of like a sanity check that what we're getting from um, these measures is what we'd expect. Um, here we found that task type and participant demographics um, seem to influence the FNIR's data quality rather than stroke factors. Um, at least the stroke factors that we looked at so far. 
um, we didn't find any data quality differences between um, the group of controls and all patients. Um, but an important note here is the um, groups were not matched for demographics. So there could be some nuance um, you know, that's, that's being lost here. In general, we found that data quality was lower for younger individuals, women, and Black participants. And again, this um, is expected and is consistent with the literature in neurologically healthy individuals. So in general, um, younger people tend to have thicker hair than older people. Um, women tend to have thicker hair than men. Um, and then there are issues with photon loss um, for individuals who have um, dark um, uh, skin as well as um, uh, for some individuals, thick, dark hair. And this is um, really nicely illustrated by a paper that came out by Quasi et al. Um, earlier this year, um, where it just kind of gives a nice illustration of the differences between two example participants. So for example, participant A um, has dark skin and dark, coarse and dense hair. Um, participant B has light skin, blonde, fine, and thin hair. And so for participant A, their coarse, dark hair that's going to, um, the coarse coarseness and denseness of their hair is going to affect scalp um, coupling indices. Um, and then um, the uh, melanin in their skin is going to uh, result in foam tongue loss that you can see there in the upper left-hand portion of this image. Now, this is just kind of the nature of how FNIRS works. But um, as quasi et al um, caution, and I want to reiterate, um, we want to avoid phenotypic exclusion. So that means we want people of color to be in our studies. And there are some potential solutions um, to optimize data quality for all individuals. So these are some kind of preliminary practice recommendations. Um, so for example, during acquisition, you can use a chest strap um, uh, to kind of get the cap um, tighter to the scalp. Um, FNIR systems are dry, but you can use gel, again, to improve scalp to opto coupling. And there are some other methods to improve it as well. Um, you also, during acquisition, want to assess data quality in real time, try and fix any issues that you observe in the raw signal. And then during processing um, or after processing, you could use scalp coupling indices or peak spectral power measures as covariates in your analyses. Um, excluding specific channels rather than participants is the recommendation um, that I want to reiterate that Quasi et al. mentioned. Um, and, and this can be done in most of the toolboxes that are available to do FNIR's um, analyses. Another important recommendation from Quasi et al. is to always report participant demographics. They did a review of the literature and they found that in the broader FNIR's literature, this is um, not being done well or consistently. And so that's very important, including reporting of race and ethnicity. Um, and then another thing that you can do is you can compare data quality measures um, between groups prior to conducting your main analyses. In terms of ways to account for task-related motion, so during acquisition, again, you can use a chest strap. Um, I would recommend that much more than a chin strap. If you have a chin strap when you're having somebody do something like picture naming, it's going to make the data quality worse. Um, again, you can exclude specific channels um, or you can, and or you can use peak spectral power as a covariate in your analysis. Okay, so that's study one. So that's... Um, in a, the, the cohort that's been seen so far at Hopkins. And so this study is kind of getting at the crux of the question that we really want to know is the utility of FNIRs in helping us understand aphasia recovery. Um, so here um, we're looking at resting state connectivity in acute and subacute um, post-stroke aphasia. And to set the scenes here, I'm going to say something that we all really know, which is that typical activity patterns and language abilities are not always restored by the chronic phase of recovery. We know this. So in the um, neuroimaging literature, there's a lot of debate about the role of residual um, left hemisphere language networks versus right hemisphere homologs versus domain general regions um, in their um, role in, a, in aphasia recovery. And so um, a few years ago now, um, Siegel and colleagues um, identified a potential phenotype of stroke injury in the um, kind of late acute to early subacute phase. Specifically in their paper, they found that um, reduced interhemisphere connectivity was significantly related to um, more severe deficits across multiple cognitive and sensory motor domains in folks that are around two weeks post-stroke. 
specific to language, they found that decreased left intrahemispheric connectivity as well as decreased interhemispheric connectivity um, were associated with more severe language impairments in their group of individuals that included folks with and without aphasia. They also investigated changes over time. And in their 2018 paper, they found that folks who tended to improve tended to show um, changes in modularity, which um, might manifest as, again, increased left intrahemispheric connectivity and increased interhemispheric connectivity over time as um, the kind of underlying patterns that promote good recovery from aphasia in these very early recovery stages. So this kind of gives us, granted, a rather kind of broad stroke sort of way of looking at potential patterns of um, uh, relationships between connectivity changes and language changes in the acute and subacute phases. So this is something that we, um, I would say, preliminarily tested um, in this pilot study. So here we had um, two research questions. For our first question, we wanted to know if FNRs derived rest and state functional connectivity patterns differ between people with aphasia in the acute phase, people with aphasia in the subacute phase, and neurologically healthy controls. We also investigated um, exploratory relationships between FNRs um, resting state um, functional connectivity patterns and language deficits in both of the patient groups. Um, the participants here are a subset of the cohort from study one. Um, so these, the patients are individuals who tested as aphasic according to the Western aphasia battery um, revised, the aphasia quotient um, below 93.8. Um, so this included uh, 12 individuals in the acute phase, eight individuals in the subacute phase, as well as 15 age match controls. And so you can see here that um, the groups were matched for demographics except for education. So I do wanna mention that um, all of the analyses that that I'm going to talk about here. Um, we uh, uh, redid those analyses controlling for education. Also to link this study back to the previous study, also redid the analyses controlling for um, spectral power and scalp coupling indices, and the general results remained the same. Um, so this slide on the upper right shows our montage. So this is the arrangement of sources and detectors. So we had 46 long distance channels in total, 24 arranged over left hemisphere parasylvian language areas and 22 over the right hemisphere homologs. And the lower right hand corner that shows the sensitivity profile. So the areas, uh, the warm areas there are areas with um, highest um, sensitivity of the signal. We also included eight short distance channels to measure physiological noise that we were able to account for in our analyses. So data were pre-processed in the nearest toolbox, also sometimes called brain analyzer. Um, and then after pre-processing, um, a pre-whitening robust fit Pearson correlation uh, model was uh, applied to the data to calculate channel-wise resting state functional connectivity based on oxyhemoglobin values. So this um, analysis is akin to an ROI to ROI analysis that you might do in an F um, fMRI task. So after that, um, the, the connections were labeled as either being left intrahemispheric, right intrahemispheric, or interhemispheric. So this slide shows the results for our first research question. So um, uh, Part A of the figure shows the significant connections within each group from um, a linear mixed effects model that we ran through the brain analyzer toolbox. Um, and these are FDR corrected at um, a P less than 0.05. Then those values were extracted and we compared them um, outside of the toolbox in R, and that's what's shown in part B of the figure. And so what you'll notice is that um, connectivity values were significantly lower in the acute group compared to the subacute group and also compared to controls, but we found no statistically significant differences between controls and subacute patients for any connection type. So that includes, we looked at all connections, we specifically looked at left interhemispheric connections, right interhemispheric connections, and interhemispheric connections. Um, these analyses show relationships, um, or this plot shows relationships between um, WAB R aphasia quotient and um, connectivity values, average connectivity values by type within each group. Granted, these are pretty small groups, um, so just, you know, that's a caveat to, um, to these 
um, data. But what you'll notice is that um, for every connection type, um, stronger connectivity was related to um, better language skills. Again, these weren't statistically significant, especially after cracking through multiple comparisons, but these trends played out not just with um, the aphasia quotient, but also with Boston Amy test scores. I also want to mention that we did look at um, relationships between connectivity um, uh, values by type and the whole group of 20 patients controlling for time since onset. With that analysis, we again found results very consistent here, but we did find statistically significant um, findings for greater um, connectivity of right connections and interhemispheric connections and less severe aphasia. So again, the um, findings um, play out um, in that way as well. Okay, so here I'm going to talk about interim conclusions because this is very much a pilot study. It's a relatively small sample of folks. It's, I think, I believe, um, I know this is recorded for forever, um, but I think this is the very first um, resting state connectivity um, study using FNIRs in post aphasia in like a group of individuals. And so um, what we found in this study is is consistent with some of the previous literature. So first of all, reduced wide widespread resting state functional connectivity in our acute patients does align with global reductions in brain function in people with aphasia and post-stroke survivors at the acute stage that has been highlighted in prior studies. Um, Upregulation of brain activity in the subacute stage um, is thought to reflect uh, a, a prime recovery mechanism in the subacute stage, um, highlighted in other studies. Um, and so perhaps our differences between the subacute and the acute stroke groups might reflect that, but there's a big caveat that I'll mention in a second. Um, and then finally, we found trends um, between higher resting state functional connectivity and better language skills in both of the sub cohorts as well as across all patients. Now, of course, the state has a few limitations. So the biggest limitation is the small sample size, but not only that, is that it's a cross-sectional sample. So that means that the same, the uh, 12 acute patients were different people than the eight subacute patients. So as we all know, there's a lot of heterogeneity across individuals with aphasia. And so to really test these, these hypotheses and to be certain or semi-certain of, of these conclusions, we'd need a longitudinal sample. Um, but this is, I think, beginning good beginning stage work. I also want to mention that our montage didn't have whole brain coverage, so that means that we didn't have control channels that we could use um, as a you know as a control in our analyses. We also didn't do source localization, so we can't be certain of it precisely where every measurement um, came from. However, for the way that we grouped the connections in this study, we can be pretty certain that the left interhemisphere connections came from the left hemisphere, and same thing for the other connection types. Okay, so those are the two preliminary studies as part of this pilot that um, I helped um, create and, and run at, at Johns Hopkins with efforts from a handful of other people that I'll mention in, in a couple of minutes. Um, I think we can feel we can be semi certain that there is some potential viability of FNIRs um, as a possible alternative to fMRI for certain studies. Now, it's not the best modality for all types of studies and all types of questions. So for example, if you're really interested in the role that subcortical structures play in recovery, this isn't the method for you because FNIRs, um, in, in, in at least right now, can't sub sample those um, subcortical structures. Because it's such a newer modality and it's not been used to the extent that fMRI has, especially in stroke recovery, um, it's important if you want to use FNIRs, I would highly recommend that you stay up to date on best practices. Um, I suppose just like any other imaging modality, there's continual evolution in what's considered best, best practices. But as a concrete example of this, um, I think it was around 2014, 2015, maybe a little bit earlier than that, um, the FNIRS community decided that short separation channels were an essential thing that needed to be added to make sure that you can regress out that measure and regress out that physiological noise. And so, you know, big advances like that, you need to um, keep 
keep um, up to date on them. Now, that being said, because it's newer, there's not necessarily standardization of instrumentation or analysis pipelines at this point. Um, and that's certainly the case also for um, when you're working with a special population like stroke survivors. So right now, the jury's out a little bit on exactly what you should do with the lesion. Um, in the motor recovery literature, um, the way that people uh, discuss how they address the lesion is rather underspecified, I would say. Um, in some papers, including one by Natalie Gilmore um, and Swati Kieran that came out a couple of years ago, um, they uh, pruned the channels. They removed channels that corresponded to where the lesion occurred. So that's one method, but still there are lots of open questions about um, how stroke um, can impact FNIR's measurements. Um, now, that being said, I think, you know, there's some fun potential for, for FNIR, some interesting potential applications, um, and some next steps that I'm particularly interested in. So, for example, um, if we consider fMRI bold, kind of the bold standard for functional imaging, one question is how do fNIR's hemoglobin, hemoglobin measurements relate to fMRI bold in post stroke aphasia? This has been um, investigated in neurologically healthy individuals, as well as at least one paper that I know of in stroke um, it, it participants who have a history of stroke in general. But again, um, there could be some specific considerations for, for our patients that weren't captured in that work. Um, and then related to study two, this is the, the, the big question or a big question, which is do longitudinal um, changes in FNIR measurements um, relate to changes in specific linguistic and non-linguistic domains in people with aphasia? And so if this um, is the case, we can use FNIRs to um, measure recovery over time, change over time. Again, because once you have an FNIR system, it doesn't cost anything to run. You can do much more frequent FNIRS imaging that you can do fMRI unless you have a very, very large grant with lots of money in order to do that. Um, and then something that I'm particularly in interested in is how FNIRS can be leveraged to measure brain behavior relationships in more naturalistic contexts. So this is a picture of a research participant who gave their permission for me to show, um, show them of, um, from another study in my lab um, at Northeastern. This doesn't involve stroke survivors, but here we have um, younger um, uh, and older healthy adults um, participate in a dual task walking, talking um, FNIRS experiment. Um, and you can see her getting set up to start to start the task there. So similar kinds of research can be done in, in individuals with post-stroke aphasia um, with you know, safety considerations, of course, in place. Um, also some fun applications, some interesting applications for, for example, multi-person or two-person scanning um, that could get at, um, for example, conversational skills in people with aphasia. So um, at this point, kind of the sky is the limit. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, and I'm excited for, um, for, uh, to talk about this more with anybody who's interested. Um, but at this point, I just want to um, uh, say a few acknowledgements. So of course, I want to thank our research participants for um, participating in our studies. Um, other members of the SCORE lab at Johns Hopkins, members from my own lab um, at Northeastern. And then a big special thanks to R.G. Hillis, Lisa Bunker, Hannah Kim, um, uh, Ali Cedurfi, Victoria tilton Belowski for um, their work on acquiring these FNIR scans of so many, many hours that we spent um, designing the tasks and ruminating over the FNIRS data. Um, there are funding sources, including a couple of grants that I um, kind of alluded to and also included some images from. And then I thank you for your attention and I would be very happy to take any questions that you have. I suggest we do questions from the room first, and then I'll, I'll monitor the questions online so we do those. I think, I'll check, I, but it's a, I think if people just speak up, they should be audible. I'll check that. If not, then please come to the room. Yeah. So, um, I do a lot of MRI and EG, but this is the first time I've really heard about Ethners. And um, I was curious if you have the um, lesion site or the MRIs for these individuals, because it, uh, in my mind, it's really interesting to see just what the signal even looks like yeah. when it is passing through lesion tissue. Yep. 
And that would be a great way to be able to account for the lesion yep. um, and maybe some of these bad channels. Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that's actually something that I've talked about with the folks at Hopkins, including RG, um, also with Swathi Kieran, who's doing Ethnir's work in her lab. Um, and so we, we did talk about that because that's, you know, that's sort of the, the basic thing that you would expect, right, is that that could be a way to um, kind of validate that, you know, what we're, the measurements that we're getting are, um, are suggesting like actual brain activity and not just um, some kind of physiological noise. From the Ethner's um, data set from Hopkins, one, one limiting factor again is that we don't have source localization. And so being able to match very precisely like lesion um, to specific channel correspondence can be challenging. But one thing um, actually that Lisa Bunker and I think Hannah are both doing in um, papers that we're, they're working on from this data set um, is that you know, we're kind of doing a general mapping of um, identifying which channels correspond to the lesion. So I should say from Hopkins, we do have either research scans or clinical scans where we delineate lesion for all participants. And so one thing that didn't just quite make its way yet into the first study is to look at a um, lesion site as a predictive factor too. Um, yeah, 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 it's a good recommendation. Yeah. This is awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Is there, so in MRI, if you use like a naming task, there are ways to kind of get around motion, so like using sparse yeah. scanning, is there like an equivalent for FNRs that maybe you might account for you know, help deal with the worst signal? Yeah, not that not that I know of. So I'll just repeat your question, um, which is that you, you said like in fMRI, there's sparse um, sample, uh, sparse scan that you can do to kind of account for, get around the motion-related artifact. Um, I, not to my knowledge that there isn't anything similar um, in fMRIs. In general, I mean, there just aren't quite as many fMRI studies as fMRI, and there are even fewer language studies. Um, and I should say, like overt speaking um, tasks. Although there is a paper from uh, a few years ago now where they um, they assessed uh, data quality in, in language tasks involving different levels of motion. Um, so no, but that being said, um, what I didn't mention here is that in pre-processing, there are different types of motion correction algorithms that you can apply. Now granted, the same way in any other task, um, you know, imaging task, if you're if the motion is correlated with the stimulus, right, then you have, then you run into an issue. Um, but in in my experience, what I found, you know, is that you ask participants to, you know, try and keep their jaw movement to a minimum. And again, if you use um, a chest strap to kind of affix the cap um, more firmly to the, the scalp, you know, that helps scalp the optocoupling, but also just helps where there's just not as much movement. Um, so, yeah, so it's kind of a workaround, but no, not not to my knowledge, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, this is really good. I've never, just like Sarah said, I, I'm not that familiar with FNIRS, but I was wondering about the image processing with regards to error. Hmm. You look at just left, right hemisphere differences because that might give you some, even though you didn't have source localization, that might give you some sense of how much error is being uh, introduced into your data by location. Yeah, that's a really good question. So you're, you're saying like in terms of, you know, like the data quality measures that are reported in study one, are there differences between left, you know, in the left hemisphere stroke patients, you would expect that there would be um, poor data um, quality in the left hemisphere than the right hemisphere. Um, I haven't. I haven't yet. Um, partially because the way that the QT mirrors toolbox like outputs the data is that it sort of just outputs everything as a big chunk. And so, in order to um, uh, kind of disentangle the channels that come from the left hemisphere versus the right, you have to do some additional processing steps. That's a really good point and something that I think we should we should look at. Um, I'm just gonna make I'm gonna make notes. It's recorded. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's true. I can just go back and look at the recording. <laughs> yeah, and, and with regards to that, I mean, I wouldn't expect. I mean, there shouldn't be differences in scalp coupling indices. Um, that would be weird. <laughs> um, but I think there should probably be potentially maybe power differences um, between hemispheres according to lesion, um, lesion location, or hemisphere. Questions from our room? We have, we have questions online. If okay. I, 
In fact, we had a question from me online. So okay. Find, you know, room and online question related to Sarah's question. I, uh, uh, but, uh, so for study two, yeah. Um, do you have access to the MRI connectivity measures so that you can look at how those uh, effect sizes correlate with your actual fMRI's effect size? Oh yeah. To get a sense of the sensitivity of the map. Yeah. So so I didn't actually mention. I showed a lesion map for study two, but I didn't actually talk about it. So we have um, some of those folks who research scans. Um, they all had clinical scans that were done at Hopkins, which is what we use um, for the acute patients to delete like the lesion. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, PTI. No. No. Um, not for everybody. But yeah, you're right. That would be another way. I mean, granted, um, functional connectivity doesn't always you know, perfectly align with structural connectivity, but um, but yeah, it would be a way to kind of get it as well. Okay. Yeah. And we had a question from uh, Kirana Sapki. Oh, okay. Great talk, Erin. Does the upregulation in the subacute group correlate with better language outcomes? Yeah, I mean, meaning that um, folks in the subacute stage in that study, again, it's cross-sectional, and so this is just from their their time that they did their first FNIRS scan. Um, when they also did the Western aphasia battery and the Boston Amy test. Yes, there tends to be a relationship between higher um, resting state connectivity by those three different types of connectivity patterns and better language skills, but I wouldn't say outcomes here because, um, uh, again, you know, at least from that study, it's cross-sectional. Now, that being said, um, uh, one um, project, kind of sub-project from here that Lisa Bunker is working on is actually um, looking at changes um, over time from one of uh, the studies, actually um, from the, the P50 study, um, Slice done at, um, done at Hopkins. So again, I can't really speak to kind of longitudinal changes as part of um, the study that I presented here, but that's, that's coming. But thanks, Kirana. Also, from from your from what you know of the of FNIRs and yeah. sensitivity, do you expect it will be um, sensitive and reliable enough to serve as input to something like a language prosthesis at some point, so that well, you know, right? In people yeah, who are, have no speech, yeah, for peripheral reasons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Might they be able to communicate through? Yeah, FNIRS? yeah. So like a human brain, um, yeah, interface kind of uh, HCI system. I mean, there's some work that's being done in like neurofeedback based um, FNIRs. I'm, um, I would say maybe peripherally involved in in the study um, that David Lin is conducting at MGH using um, FNIRs based neurofeedback for upper limb. Um, uh, uh, treatment, um, pairing that with exercise for um, stroke survivors who are hemiparetic, um, potentially. But again, I think there, I think there's some, I think it's further down the road compared to other um, neuroimaging modalities. Thank you very much. Great, great yeah. talk. I enjoyed it. So quick question that I have about like, when you're comparing the FNEs with MRI and the result from MRI, um, I'm not still sure what we're trying to do. Are we trying to say that like if these some um, MRI is the gold standard approach and we're trying to get to that point that the correlation is like one by one? Or if news is capturing something different than MRIs mm -hmm. can be used as a complement of approach for so the FNIR system, um, the FNIR sig signals, so changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin um, are highly correlated with fMRI bold. Um, by high correlations, I mean, I think somewhere in like 0.9 something something. So it's essentially getting at a, a, the same um, brain metabolism response. Um, there are a handful of papers that have, um, that have compared, um, um, have correlated FNIRS um, uh, hemoglobin measures and um, uh, fMRI bold. Um, one that comes up at the top of my head, Ted Hupper at, um, at uh, the uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh has a paper, I think, from 2006, and there are some other papers after that. Um, so maybe not you know, a correlation of one, but a pretty high correlation. Yeah, yeah I guess my question is like, uh... I don't know, I'm trying to say, like, 
it, it, let's say the MRI actually answers and addresses all the concerns that you raised here about MRI and EEG and other imaging approaches, and the things that actually we, be, we benefit from the FNIRs, and then we have a better correlation with fMRI. Do even we need to use FNIRs for these? Oh, I see, yeah. Well, so I think there are some, um, there are certain um, clinical populations who, for example, have contraindications to F, um, fMRI, who, you know, so somebody with um, implanted metal cardiac pacemakers who can't do research MRIs, um, folks with cochlear implants um, who can't do MRI. So there are actually quite a more um, FNIR studies in folks who have cochlear implants than there are in, in probably not in people um, who have post aphasia. So I think there are certain times when FNIRs can be, um, so I think the, um, the suggestion for making sure that we're getting similar measurements from both types of imaging modalities is for those instances that ethnic might be better suited um, for whatever research questions you have. So again, you know, I'm thinking you know, longitudinal imaging in um, neurodegenerative disease, right? If we want to try and um, sample, you know, sample the brain like over time, for with multiple scans, if FNIRs can be done at no expense, besides perhaps personnel expense, you know, versus an, an fMRI, it might have some utility also because, you know, certain systems, you know, the system that I have is portable and it's really easy to go to somebody's house. So I've done um, FNIRs imaging um, at in participant houses. Actually, one thing, hold on, forget all of this. Um, so one thing I didn't talk about, um, I don't have many extra slides, but this is one. So in the Hopkins pilot, um, we actually tested folks at different um, locations. So the majority, the reason why I didn't include this is because I did look at stroke chronicity, and here, you know, the stage that somebody was in aligns pretty closely with where they underwent FNIRS imaging. So for example, the majority of patients in the acute phase actually underwent um, FNIRS um, at bedside, whereas, you know, folks that are in the subacute phase, uh, chronic phase, and controls are mostly seen in an office. We do, we, Hopkins has um, a mobile stroke um, van, and so, which is called the Star Car, and some folks um, actually underwent M uh, FNIRS imaging um, in the stroke van. And so, because of that, again, like, you couldn't do that with fMRI. So, I think there's a time and place, right, for each um, type of modality. You know, if you have very specific questions about, um, uh, a very specific um, structure in the brain, um, you know, activity at the uh, uh, temporal parietal junction, for example, you know, and um, the spatial resolution of FNIRS is not as good as fMRI. So then perhaps FNIRS is not the modality for you. So I think it really depends on the research question, but showing that the bold, um, fMRI bold and FNIRS measurements are equivalent, you know, I think it is a useful methodological next step. Yeah, and I would, um, I, I think this is really important work to validate it in the short population um, because not only do you have like these population or specific location, you know, uh, requirements for, for different, different studies, 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 but I think, I think, as, you're, I think you as, you're, as you pointed out, it's also really nice, nice. I feel like that the, the MRI also has limitations uh, in terms of what kind of stimuli you can present, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and this idea that you can actually have a more functional, yes. interactive, yeah. um, more lifelike environment, yeah. uh, that alone, I think, uh, is really interesting, actually, to think that you have more flexibility in the paradigms yeah. that you are uh, looking at. So Yeah, and that's actually the reason why I first started kind of thinking of moving in the direction of using FNIRS more, because I am really interested in how you know, people with um, post stroke aphasia are actually communicating in more functional contexts, and you know it's pretty hard to do that in the in an fMRI scanner. So, yeah. I just want to say it's a missed opportunity to the, the car isn't called the C Star Star Car. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, think I mean, that, you can you can bring up the RG. I, mean. I think that brings us to the end of our session. No more questions online. Thank you so much. Everyone. Yeah, thank you. All.